Uh, and uh, all right, so let's let's jump into this with Beta Ginsburg. I mean, you've probably I'm not going to give her bio and stuff. I think you can read that elsewhere. It's all over the news. It's all over everywhere. I mean, obviously, a, an incredibly accomplished woman, an incredibly successful woman, a woman who who was was path breaking in terms of the acceptance of women into the legal profession. Uh, at the beginning of her career, the second female uh, Supreme Court justice, uh, somebody who, who uh, clerks of hers have written about how supportive she was and, and how helpful she was in in the careers of those clerks. Uh, uh, at, when she was in the Supreme Court, she was a good friend of Anthony Scalia. So obviously, a, an incredibly sharp mind. I don't think you make the Supreme Court without a sharp mind, and I don't think, <laughs> I don't think, um, I don't think any Scalia, Anthony Scalia uh, becomes your friend without a sharp mind. A woman who obviously I disagreed with on many, many things, and and disagreed with her opinions uh, as a Supreme Court judge on many, many things. But but you have to admire somebody who had had some principles um, and and fought for those principles and stood by them. And on issues like abortion, she represented my voice on the Supreme Court. So I very much supported her opinions on abortion. And I think she held in the balance um, a, uh, a an important, uh, you know, the, the she held the pro-abortion position. Uh, she was she was strongly supportive of that position, was a voice for that position on the Supreme Court. And we'll talk about that because I think that one of the consequences of uh, of Trump appointing a, a her replacement will be, I think, the death of Rosa versus Wade, the death of abortion protection at the federal level, and then then it's going to be interesting. Then it's going to be interesting where that takes us. Um, you know, she uh, she was a, a strong character. You know, over the last few years. She's been incredibly sick, in and out of hospital, in and out of emergency rooms, cancer treatments. She basically did everything she could to hang on and not die while Trump was president. I mean, I don't think there's any question about that being the case. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's going to be... Yeah, so... Really smart, really bright, really important for the advancement of women in the legal profession. A real fighter. I mean, let, you know, you, you can disagree with somebody and still view them as a as a real foe. And I think, and I respect them as a real opponent. And I think that's what uh, Scalia, Justice Scalia's attitude towards this. I think some Scalia, uh, Scalia's son has written a tribute to her. Uh, you can fa- you can find hit that on his tweets on his Twitter account. So I think she she garnered real respect from her, from her opponents, and that's to her credit. I, I think uh, flags flying at half mast, um, you know, across across uh, Washington D.C. makes a lot of sense today. Um, in in her honor, so uh, you know, a, 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 a significant a significant woman who's who's achieved significant things in her life. Uh, and uh, we, as objectivists, I think, who recognize accomplishment and shouldn't view everything through the v- through the prism of politics, I think, should be in a position to recognize that and to appreciate to appreciate that. So, my respects to to uh, to R B G, which is the term that people use to refer to him. All right. Uh, so now the political question. The political question is: Should Trump nominate a replacement? Uh, and uh, Trump has indicated he will. The Senate, Senate Republicans, at least Mitch McConnell, has indicated that he will bring a uh, Trump nominee to a vote. It's not clear Republicans have enough votes. Um, there are a number of Republicans that have expressed their opinion that they should not be bringing a candidate to a vote right now. Less than two months, um, less than two months before an election, and of course there's a precedent. The precedent for this was under Obama, when Scalia died, and it's interesting that Scalia created the fury around 2016. It is his friend RBG who's creating the fury right now. When Scalia died, about 11 months before the election, and Republicans uh, held the Senate, Republicans refused to bring a nominee. Uh, forward to being, uh, it is the president who uh, 
presents the nominee. It is the Senate that must confirm the nominee. And Republicans uh, refuse to even consider, even bring to debate, never mind vote, on a um, a, on um, Obama's nominee. So Obama nominated a kind of a leftist, but a centrist leftist, because he had a Republican Senate to contend with. A, 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 a rabid leftist could have never passed, probably not passed that Senate. Uh, and uh, Republicans were in a position to at least vote and maybe vote his candidate down. They did not want to vote the candidate down because there's a tradition in the Senate that you vote for candidates that you believe are qualified. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 the person that uh, the judge that uh, Obama had nominated was certainly qualified. So what they decided to do was say, look, uh, we want to wait until after the election. And the reasoning there was, look, the Senate is Republican. The people have voted for Republican Senate twice in 16 and in 18. In eight, uh, sorry, in, uh, in uh, 12, what was it? 12 and in 14. And uh, we have a majority Senate. And therefore, uh, we have divided government. Uh, and we should let the people resolve who they want as their next uh, Supreme Court judge by letting the... Uh, you know, let the vote go through in the um, in the presidential election. Now, I think that was a disingenuous argument. I think they should have voted, and if they didn't want this guy, they should have voted him down. But to delay a nomination for eleven months because of a pending election was a precedent. It was, uh, it, you know, and it was just Mary Garland was the name of the of the candidate. Um, it was wrong. It was uh, it was uh, disingenuous. The the reasoning was made up. They just didn't want to be in this quandary of voting him down. And they didn't want to confirm it. So they, f they fudged the rules in a sense and didn't even consider him. And you have to remember that then the Republicans did one more thing, which is going to be crucial, crucial if the Democrats win the Senate at some point down the road. Certainly if they win the Senate soon, if they win the Senate in this election and Biden gets becomes president, Republicans will pay for this, but in during Trump's during the Trump administration, uh, Trump, if you remember, has been calling for throughout his presidency the elimination of the filibuster, the idea that you need sixty votes to really to vote on a, on a, on an amendment. So you really need sixty supporters to get any bill passed. Trump has been against that. Um, the Republicans have held their ground on the filibuster; they've kept the filibuster, but then. But then they eliminated the filibuster for judicial nominees, at least for Supreme Court nominees. I'm not sure if it goes all the way down to other kinds of judges. So uh, the Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, I, I don't think Gorsuch got 60. I know Kavanaugh didn't get 60. Gorsuch and Kavanaugh were the first Supreme Court justices, at least in modern times, to have been elected to the Supreme Court without 60 votes. So twice Republicans have changed the precedents have changed the, the kind of the traditions. Yeah, uh, 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 Gorsuch got 55 votes. I think uh, Kavanaugh got 50, 51, I think. I think 51, 48 to 51, something like that. Maybe it was 52 to 48. Um, they've changed the, the historical precedents, right? Uh, in order to get, to get their way. Not taking a vote on, um, on Merrick Garland, and uh, doing away with the filibuster for the purposes of, uh, of nominating a, um, a judge that they wanted and passing a judge that they wanted. Remember, right? right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the first time that this idea of, of, of 60 votes was removed, right? Uh, it was removed under Reed, and that was, yes, and... and um, it, it's it's it, so the, this idea of eliminating it. Okay, so it was fifty to forty eight by Kavanaugh, two abstained. Um, the idea of eliminating the filibuster basically makes us more of a democracy. The idea of 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 you know fudging the rules in the Senate to get your way makes us more of a democracy and less of a constitutional republic. 
The whole idea of what the founders created here is a system of government that makes it difficult to pass legislation, difficult to make fast changes. And the Senate, recognizing the dangers of a simple majority, introduced the filibuster. Originally, you had a literally filibuster. And then they exchanged that literally filibuster means literally speak. Right? Then they, they, they replaced that with the 60 votes. And now they've done away with it with judges and Democrats are already threatening to do away with the filibuster completely if they win the Senate uh, in, um, in this election and if, the, if Biden gets elected as, uh, as president. So uh, again, whatever you vote for president, I do think you should vote Republican in the Senate if only to prevent the Democrats from doing away with the filibuster, which I think would be a disaster. Of course, again, Trump has been advocating for doing away with the filibuster for a long, long time. Yeah, the filibuster was never supposed to be what it became because it was supposed to be somebody could stand up and speak and hold up a vote by speaking. But I like the fact that they need 60 votes because I think it prevents bad laws from getting through. And we have a lot of bad laws. Almost all bad laws are bad. Almost all laws are bad. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in gridlock. So... You know, Republicans basically um, violate tradition in 2016 by not bringing um, Garland to a vote, uh, change the filibuster rules, and now, uh, less than two months before a vote for the presidency, are going to cram through a, a judicial nominee of their choosing. If the Democrats win both the presidency and the Senate, they're going to be in a very bad mood. <laughs> they're going to want payback. And there are two things that they are likely to do. Not likely, but at least a threatening to do. We'll see if that turns out to be likely. One is that they are likely to uh, do away with the filibuster completely so they can get a Green New Deal, they can get socialized medicine, Medicare for all, whatever, uh, 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 public choice, whatever, whatever they want. They, they'll cram through the Senate and there'll be no stopping them because they, if the Republicans lose everything, they would lose everything. And second is, Benjamin says, Democrats can eat it 6-3 and it's done. No, it's not done. The fact is that the Democrats can change the number of Supreme Court justices. What Democrats can do and what has been threatened in the past and what they're threatening right now, you, if you follow the news, you'll see Democrats actually making this threat, is that they can expand the Supreme Court to 11 justices, nominate two of their own, and at least bring it back to six to five. That's what they can do. FDR threatened to do that. FDR threatened to do that. And as a consequence of threatening to do that, um, the Supreme Court, it, it basically caved. But there's nothing, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing. Um, he didn't try to. He threatened it. It was a realistic threat. And as a consequence, he got to what he wanted. Because they didn't force his hand into doing it. But there's nothing to stop Democrats from expanding the court to 11 and nominating two of their judges. Again, they feel cornered, just like Republicans have felt cornered when Democrats do the, the BS, and given, given the tribalism and given the antagonism, the hatred, the division, the, 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 where they are today, it, is a, it would be a disaster to see this kind of gamesmanship at the Supreme Court level of expanding the court when you get, when you get bad, nominees you don't like. But I wouldn't be surprised if they did it. So first is, there's a real potential for really bad political outcomes as we move forward that this has created. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's avoidable. I don't think there's anything that can be done. I mean, we'll see 
whether there's enough Republican senators to support a nominee, uh, you know, uh, just a, just less than two months before an election, a presidential election. I'm not sure. Right now, there are at least three to four Republican senators who are wavering. They can afford to lose three. So it's a 50-50 tie, and then, and then uh, Pence steps in and votes. But even that would, would mean a, a, a Supreme Court gets a judge where it's even worse than the Kavanaugh, you know, 50 to 48, where it's 50-50 or 51-50, where the, where the vice president had a vote in. And, and that'll set up an even more contentious future. That'll set up an even more tribalistic and even more, you know, Republicans, Democrats, he does other throats future. So, you know, we will see. The other issue is, of course, who is Trump going to nominate? Who is Trump going to nominate for the court? Right now, we have a uh, conservative majority in the court, but it's not that conservative. And you've got uh, you've got Roberts and even Gorsuch, who have uh, voted in an unexpected unexpected ways. Um, it's a court that's unlikely to reverse Roe versus Wade. Uh, it might weaken Roe versus Wade, but it's unlikely to reverse it and showed no inclination to reverse it. But the fact is that, and to me, you know, abortion is a big deal. It's a big deal. It's, it's it, you know, and it was to Ayn Rand. I mean, Ayn Rand basically viewed this as one of the most important political issues that we face one of the most important uh, uh, litmus tests, if you will, for candidates. I mean, one of the reasons she wouldn't vote for, she didn't vote for Reagan was because of his opposition to abortion and his elevation of the issue to such a high ranking. Well, um, it appears that the number one candidate that Trump has, now we'll see who, who he ultimately nominates, but it looks like he's going to try to replace um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg with a woman, and, and the number one candidate for that is Amy Connie Barrett. Amy Connie Barrett is a, um, you know, is the uh, U.S. Accords, she's a judge on the U.S. Accords uh, Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit based in Chicago. Uh, she was confirmed to that court in 2017. She, she was a Trump nominee. She's been vetted. She's gone through the Senate. Uh, they know what they're going to after, uh, you know, so, so she's kind of an easy nomination. Uh, she was being on the short list. Um, she was on the short list with Kavanaugh. Uh, and uh, she is a devout Catholic, a devout Catholic. And she has, uh, she is... Uh, has seven kids is a reflection of that devout uh, of her being devout, a devout Catholic, and and she would overturn Roe versus Wade in a, in a blink of an eye. She would do it in an instant. Um, she claims that she does not allow her religious belief to interfere in her legal uh, decision making, and I'd like to believe her. I'd like to believe her, but I don't really. Uh, and uh, th there's nothing to suggest that she wouldn't. Uh, other nominee, other suggestions, um, other uh, people that have been mentioned, uh, Allison Rushing, who is a U.S. Court of Appeals in the fourth court based in Virginia. Is 30, she's young. She's 38. Uh, very anti-gay, very religious right, very, very anti-abortion. Um, other nominees, it's less clear. The only guy, the only man on the list uh, on what has come out as a shortlist by a variety of different news sources is a guy as a judge by the name of Amul Thapar, who is of Indian heritage. Uh, he is 51. He is also Catholic. I don't know how religious he is. He converted to Catholicism when he got married. Uh, and he is a U.S. Court of Appeals for the 6th District based in Cincinnati and a favorite of uh, Mitch McConnell's. So... I don't know, somebody, uh, somebody, I think Ryan says uh, uh, that he's pretty convinced that, uh, that uh, Roe versus Wolves will not be appealed, no, no matter, will not be reversed no matter what. I disagree. Uh, I think it's going to go pretty quickly. It, certainly if they get a six vote, if, if the Republicans 
if they put on one of these judges uh, who is committed to uh, an anti-abortion position, I think that I think that abortion gets voted voted against pretty quickly. Um, I don't think Roe versus Wade was particularly well decided. I think it's left a lot of holes. Just um, uh, what do you call it? Legally, I think the idea the the right to an abortion is something that uh, is is a the left has a really hard time defending, given that it doesn't really defend rights in any other arena. Uh, I think that conservatives uh, present themselves as having the moral high ground. Uh, and I think Roe versus Wade gets gets overturned. If they get six to three, Roe versus Wade is out. And, and again, uh, Ayn Rand at least considered uh, the abolition of abortion, at, at least at the federal level, um, to be a horrific possibility and, and an anti-freedom, anti-rights uh, bellwether, right? And, and, and uh, so something to keep in mind is that uh, gay marriage might be at risk, although I, I doubt they'd actually vote that off. I think there are enough conservatives on the court right now who would vote for gay marriage right now that they wouldn't reverse that. And it's a recent enough a ruling that I don't think it will reverse, but I think abortion is at real risk, real risk. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals. Uh, and uh, and show your support for all for, for for the work for the value hopefully you're receiving from this, and uh, and of course don't forget if you're not a subscriber even if you even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up you'll know what shows are on when they're on you'll get notified right so um, yes like. Share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.